History Network, the, Af the African History Network, and our YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I M H O T E P. So follow us there. We're also broadcasting on 9, 10 a.m. Superstations, uh, WFDF, broadcasting on their Facebook page uh, as well. All right. So follow them, uh, 9, 10 a.m. Superstation, WFDF. Follow them there also. Okay. So um, we got the news on uh, Friday that uh, off, uh, ex officer Kim Potter in uh, Brooklyn Center in Minnesota was uh, sentenced by Judge Regina Chu to only two years, 24 months, for killing Dante Wright. Now, we know she was convicted, but I was holding my breath for the sentencing because I wasn't exactly sure how the sentencing was going to go. Um, I figured she'd cry some more and show some real tears, things like this, try to gain some sympathy. And uh, that's what happened. So she was sentenced to 24 months. Now with good behavior, she can do only end up doing 16 months. Uh, she will also receive credit for 58 days. She'll also receive credit for 58 days uh, that's already served in custody. Okay. So uh, we're going to talk about this. This is a good piece from uh, the New York Times uh, on this story. And then also uh, we did a good segment of this on we did a good segment of this on Roland Martin and filtered as well. OK. Um, now, on today's show, we'll also deal with. Uh, give you an update on what's going on with Brian Flores. You know, last Sunday was a Super Bowl Sunday, and we had our Super Bowl show, and we talked about uh, NFL's racism problem, and we talked about how the halftime show with the hip hop artists and things like this, and Dr. Dre and Snoop and Eminem, Mary J. Blige, Kendrick Lamar, all this, Fifty Cent, all this. This is a distraction from NFL's racism problem. And, you know, we've been covering the lawsuit of um, uh, Brian Flores, who was fired by the Miami Dolphins. OK, so Brian Flores has been picked up by the Pittsburgh Steelers. He's been uh, offered a assistant coaching position, senior defensive assistant and linebackers coach. But his lawsuit continues. His lawsuit continues. So we're going to talk about that uh, also on today's show. His lawsuit continues. And he has a, a really good lawsuit. Now he has to prove it in court, but I mean, so far he has a really good lawsuit. Okay, so we'll we'll talk about that also. Um, we saw that uh, on Thursday show, I, I, I did a story dealing with um, a Black History Month lesson in Indiana, Nineveh, Indiana at an elementary school where the uh, school counselor sent home a permission slip and gave parents the option to opt out of the, um, out, out, out their ch children out of the Black History Month lesson. Um, this took place at Spronica Elementary School. Spronica Elementary School, which is, um, has 240 students. It's in Nineveh, Indiana, which is in Southern Indiana. It's in Brown County. And the school is 97% white. Okay, the school is 97% white. Now we ended up talking, I, I talked about this on Thursday show. So many of you watch, saw the show, watch it during the week, you know, you saw this on Thursday. We ended up talking about it on Roland Martin Unfiltered on Friday. So I'm going to share that segment with you as well. And then there was a there was a piece from um, there was a segment from uh, the read uh, the readout with Joanne Reed that dealt with um, critical race theory and African American History Month lessons, things like this, and the attack that many teachers are under right now during Black History Month and not knowing what they can teach, et cetera. Uh, GOP continues to stoke rage, racialized anxiety among whites for political gain. 
I did not get a chance to get to that um, story on Thursday's show because our show on Thursday is only an hour. So we're going to get to that on today's show. OK, now there was a there was a good article from February 12th from The New York Times, because I, I monitor about 35 different news sources on a daily basis. And um, I read The New York Times, Washington Post every day. Those are two uh, sources I uh, always read, uh, as well as African-American sources, the Grio and NewsOne.com. There was an article from. Um, the New York Times teachers tackle Black History Month under new restrictions. Teachers tackle Black History Month under new restrictions. OK, in states where laws now limit classroom discussions about race and discrimination, many teachers are watching what they say and are more anxious about their jobs. And once again, this is an example of how elections have consequences. Uh, whether you talk about in Georgia, whether you talk about in Florida, whether you talk about in Oklahoma, there have been 14 states so far that have passed these uh, bills targeting critical race theory. OK, there have been 14 states so far. This article right here from New York Times from February 12, 2022, teachers tackle Black History Month under new regimes. OK, so we're going to talk about this because this is this is tied to the piece dealing with Indiana uh, uh, that we talked about on Thursday show. And we talked about Friday on Roller Martin. And uh, earlier in the month, we dealt with this story here from uh, Axios dot com. Uh, this story from February 5th, 2022 for Axios that uh, deals with new rules are limiting how teachers can teach Black History Month. New rules are limiting how teachers can teach Black History Month. This is from February 5th, 2022. And it, 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 one of the things it says is schools and universities are marking Black History Month starting today, but this is the first time it will be celebrated under new restrictions on diversity uh, on diversity education imposed by some states, new restrictions on diversity education by some states, the restraints under the guise of banning the teaching of critical race theory and critical race theory is not taught in K through 12 schools limit what some state supported institutions can discuss about the nation's racial past educators embracing black history have received death threats, some, some of them. It's rare cases, but it's happened. Since 2021, since last year, 14 states have imposed such restrictions through legislation, executive actions, or commission votes, and Education Week analysis found. So, uh, and then you have um, 35 states that have introduced bills or taken other steps to restrict teaching critical race theory even though critical race theory is not taught in K through 12 and critical race theory is a concept that focuses on the legacy of systemic racism or these uh, measures have, have limited how teachers can discuss racism and sexism and sexism in schools. Okay. So we'll discuss that um, on today's show. Uh, you know, early in the week, we talked about um, Brian Richardson calling out the, uh, International Olympics Committee uh, on a double standard when it came to uh, Camila Vileva uh, being able to compete even though she failed a drug test. And we, we dealt with that uh, early in the week uh, a couple of times. And then we saw that um, uh, Camila Vileva uh, finished fourth in her competition and uh, did not medal, okay? We'll talk a little bit about that. I'll give you an update a little bit on that also. All right, you listen to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. The Superstation, the Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotep. We'll be back in a few minutes.
The work that I do is larger than the fashion industry. It's larger than the art world. And I believe that I was born to bring newness into this world. I'm Kaima McIntyre. I'm 24 years old and I'm an artist. I create everything from paintings to jewelry design, metaphysical jewelry to be specific, and fashion design. The only reason why my prom dress went viral is because people needed it. Within a few days of going viral, Notori Naughton reached out to me and she's like, I saw your dress, can you make me a dress? I was equally as shocked to be asked by a celebrity to design their dress at the age of 17. That's just one person and the list just continues to go on to Janet Jackson, to Tyra Banks. It really hits home. That means that the discussion is happening on the grounds in real time. iRedify is a black-owned digital platform that showcases black and brown cultures and people. The books on the platform are written by African-American authors, Afro-Caribbean authors, African authors, and so much more. Kids 14 and under can read eBooks, listen to audiobooks, and complete learning activities. Kids can even write in the books digitally. Get unlimited access to everything on the platform for only $8.99 a month at iRedify.com. Sign up for your membership today. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation, the Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotep. It is Sunday, uh, February 20th, 2022, and we are live. Call the numbers 313-778-7600. 313-778-7600 is the call in number if you have a question or comment. Okay, uh, we're going to go to this story here dealing with Kim Potter. I was on Roland Martin Unfiltered on Friday. We talked about that. Uh, before we go to that, very quickly, we're going to clip one here in just a second, Jalen. Very quickly, I want to remind you that you can uh, still register for the online classes I teach on Saturdays and Sundays. On Saturday, it is uh, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade where they didn't teach you in school. This is a 10-week online class that I teach dealing with thousands of, thousands of years of history and what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place, okay? So uh, next class is going to be Saturday, um, February 26th. We had a great class uh, this weekend. As soon as you register, you can watch the class we did this weekend. Uh, so I do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. You can go back and watch it anytime. Um, the class is regularly $130. It's on sale $80. And then... So a year from now, you can go back and watch the class if you want to. You can use this with your children also. I would say the content is PG-13. On Sundays, I teach from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. We had a great class. So uh, you can order the you can register for the classes in a bundle pack. Uh, you get both classes for $120, regularly $260. And if you've taken any uh, online classes with, with me in the past, Email me at AHN show at African History Network dot com. You'll get 50 percent off. All right. OK, um, I want to go to uh, we'll go to that clip here in just a second, Jalen. So a lot of us were watching live uh, Judge Regina Chu um, give these uh, sentencing to uh, ex Brooklyn Center uh, police officer Kimberly Potter. Uh, in the killing of Dante Wright. And uh, going into the trial, I said she had about a 50-50 chance of being convicted. And after she was convicted, um, I wanted to see what the sentencing was going to be. So Kim Potter sentenced to two years in prison for killing Dante Wright. Uh, if we look quickly here at this piece from the New York Times, a former uh, police officer who fairly, fairly shot Dante Wright during the traffic stop was sentenced to two years in prison on Friday, February 18th, far less than the standard of about seven years for manslaughter. So the prosecution was asking for seven years and two months. All right. The defense wanted probation. The defense wanted probation for Kim Potter. 
uh, far less than the standard of about seven years for manslaughter after a judge said leniency was warranted because the officer had meant to fire her taser and not her gun. Okay. Um, jurors convicted the officer, Kimberly Potter, on two counts of manslaughter in December. They found that she acted recklessly when she fired a bullet into Dante Wright's chest after warning that she was going to stun him and yelling, taser, taser, taser. Now, Kimberly Potter, a 49-year-old white woman uh, who served on the police force in Brooklyn Center for 26 years, resigned two days after the shooting in April of 2021 during a time of chaotic protests over the killing of Dante Wright, uh, a 20-year-old African-American man. She has been in prison since the guilty verdict on December 23rd. Judge Regina Chu sentenced Kimberly Potter on only the most serious count of first degree manslaughter in accordance with Minnesota state law. The state sentencing guidelines list the felony count as having a presumptive punishment of a little more than uh, seven years in prison, though the maximum penalty is 15 years in prison. Judge Regina Chu said the case was far different from most manslaughter cases, as well as from other high profile police killings. Quote, this is not a cop found guilty of murder for using his knee to pin down a person for nine and a half minutes as he gasped for air. Judge Regina Chu said, referring to Derek Chauvin, Minneapolis police officer who brutally killed George Floyd. She went on to say, this is a cop who made a tragic mistake she drew her firearm thinking it was a taser and ended up killing a man. As I stated in the role of Martin Unfiltered, and you're going to hear in a few minutes, after she shot Dante Wright, she didn't run down the street and render aid. She didn't say the car went that way. Let's go help. I accidentally shot him. She focused on herself. She, she called her uh, a union representative. She, she And she talked about that she grabbed the wrong gun. She said she's going to prison. She's been trained to save lives, but she didn't focus on saving Dante Wright's life. We discussed this on Roland Martin and Filter. So here you're going to you're going to hear from the courtroom and you're going to hear the uh, sentencing from Judge Regina Chu. Let's go to clip one, Jalen. Departure. Turning to defendant's request for a dispositional departure, there is no question that Ms. Potter is extremely remorseful. She showed that today. She showed that um, when it happened. It is also beyond dispute that she is particularly amenable to probation. But the court retains the discretion to make departure decisions independently. The court is not required to depart even where mitigating factors are present, and that's set forth in State versus Birch, 689 Northwest 2nd, 276, affirmed by the Supreme Court, 707 Northwest 2nd, 660. This has been an extremely difficult decision. In making my decision, I look to the purposes of incarceration. There are four, retribution, incapacitation, deterrence, and rehabilitation. Three of the four would not be served in this case. Incapacitation refers to the physical removal of a convicted person to prevent them from committing future crimes. That is not an issue in this case. Kimberly Potter does not present a danger of future crimes, obviously. Deterrence refers to the prevention of future crime and the idea that those who have committed crimes will be discouraged from reoffending after experiencing punishment. 
that purpose would not be served here. Rehabilitation is also not a purpose that would justify incarceration in this case. Ms. Potter does not require rehabilitation to become a law-abiding citizen. Retribution or serving time as a way for a convicted person to pay for the harm inflicted on a victim is the sole purpose that applies in this case. And in this case, a young man was killed because Officer Potter was reckless. There rightfully should be some accountability. Sentencing guidelines are just that. They are guidelines that inform a judge regarding sentencing for various crimes. They are not set in stone. The court has the discretion to depart from guidelines depending on the particular facts of a case. A downward durational departure is justified if a crime is less onerous than typical. Put another way, if the conduct is significantly less serious than that typically involved in the commission of the crime, sentencing below the guidelines is justified. I find the facts and circumstances here justify a downward departure from the guidelines. First, Officer Potter's conduct was significantly less serious than your typical manslaughter case. The misdemeanor predicate for the manslaughter count was reckless handling or use of a firearm. Here, everybody agrees and the evidence is undisputed that Officer Potter never intended to use her firearm. She mistakenly drew her firearm at all times intending to use her taser. There were police officers and experts who testified that the use of her taser was reasonable and appropriate under the circumstances, circumstances presented for officer safety reasons. The fact she never intended to draw her firearm makes this case less serious than other cases. Second, the scene was chaotic, tense, and rapidly evolving. Officer Potter was required to make a split-second judgment. That constitutes a mitigating circumstance. Finally, unlike other manslaughter one cases, Officer Potter's actions were not driven by personal animosity toward Dante Wright. Instead, she was acting in the line of duty and effectuating a lawful arrest. This case is highly unusual. The other officer cases tried in this court are distinguishable. All right, we'll continue this on the other side of the break. You listen to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. Jeanette Davis is a well-established author with six published books. Black Survival in White America from Past History to the Next Century was published in 1995, and it delves into the history of African Americans before slavery up to contemporary times. The Great Divide Between Blacks and Whites was released in 2008, and her autobiography, Black Just Like My Mama, was published in 2010. Soulful Journey, The Business of Beings, was released in December 2021, and her two latest books, Echoes from the Heart, Love Throws Poetry, and Master Being Human, were both published in January of 2022. 
Jeanette Davis writings delve deeply into the psyche of black people from ancient to contemporary times. She cuts no corners and leaves no stones unturned in relating truth, letting the chips fall where they may on both African and European doorsteps. Order Jeanette Davis's books today at Amazon.com. Search for Jeanette Davis and get to know her work today. STEM Forward, helping our community find their place in the emerging fields of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Join us for our monthly live stream on our website, stemforwardedu.org. Watch, subscribe, share. Also join our mailing list to stay up to date with STEM resources and opportunities. STEM Forward, the future is now. Watch, subscribe, share. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation, the Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotep. It is Sunday, February 20th, 2022, and we are live calling numbers 313-778-7600. 313-778-7600 is the call-in number if you have a question or comment. So right before the break, we were talking about the sentencing of ex-Brooklyn Center, uh, Minnesota police officer, Kimberly Potter, who was sentenced to only two years in the killing of Dante Wright. Uh, we talked about this in Roland Martin Unfiltered. I'm going to go back to that segment. Uh, I, was on, um, I was a panelist on Roland Martin Unfiltered on Friday, and we discussed this. You're also going to hear reporting on location uh, outside the Brooklyn Center courthouse by uh, Georgia Fort, who is a independent journalist. She was reporting for Roland Martin and filtered as well. Check out this article from lawandcrime.com. Ex-cop Kim Potter sentenced to less than two years behind bars for killing Dante Wright. Judge says defendant was no Derek Chauvin. Judge says defendant was no Derek Chauvin. This is from lawandcrime.com. So she was sentenced to two years. She gets 58 days credit for, uh, days already served uh, she can be out in 16 months for good behavior if she acts she, she behaves herself there's no guarantee she's going to behave herself she could no telling how she's going to act in prison uh kimberly potter the former brooklyn center uh minnesota police officer convicted of manslaughter in the shooting death of dante wright who was 20 years old has been sentenced to 24 months uh, but only but only some of that time will be served in prison. Judge Regina Chu said um, ex-officer Kimberly Potter would be required to serve 16 months behind bars. That's two thirds of the sentence, two thirds of the 24 month sentence and the remaining one third uh, on supervised release. Now, Kimberly Potter will also be fined one thousand dollars, be forced to pay additional assessments and cannot use firearms or explosives, cannot use firearms or, or explosives. She's receiving 58 days credit for um, uh, time already served, okay? All right, so uh, we know she um, shot and killed Dante Wright, April 11th, 2021. A Hennepin County jury found Kimberly Potter, found Kimberly Potter guilty of both first degree and second degree manslaughter um on uh december 23rd 2021 and we talked about that here on this show also i'm gonna go back to this uh clip here from the courtroom uh this is from roland martin unfiltered from friday february 18 2022 let's go back to the clip Jalen. this is not a cop found guilty of murder for using his knee to pin down a person for nine and a half minutes as he gasped for air. This is not a cop found guilty of manslaughter for intentionally drawing his firearm and shooting across his partner and killing an unarmed woman who appro approached his squad. This is a cop who made a tragic mistake. She drew her firearm thinking it was a taser and ended up killing a young man. Ms. Potter, will you please rise? 
Given all these considerations and having carefully considered the comments of the family and of both Dante Wright and the comments of Kimberly Potter, as well as the arguments of counsel, it is the sentence and judgment of this court that you shall be committed to the custody of the Commissioner of Corrections for a period of 24 months. You shall serve two thirds of that time or 16 months in prison and a third on supervised release, assuming no disciplinary, disciplinary offenses or conditional release violations. You have credit for 58 days already served. Restitution will be reserved. There will be a fine of $1,000 and a surcharge of $78 to be taken out of prison wages or due within 180 days. You must provide a DNA sample. You may not use or possess any firearms, ammunition, or explosives. You have the right to appeal the conviction and sentence. If you are unable to pay the cost of, a, of an appeal, you may apply for leave to appeal at state expense by contacting the state public defender. You may be seated, Ms. Potter. I'd like to make a few parting comments. I recognize there will be those who disagree with the sentence that I granted a significant downward departure does not in any way diminish Dante Wright's life. Potter was convicted of first and second degree manslaughter in December. Joining me now is journalist Georgia Ford, who has been covering this case in the Brooklyn Center. Georgia, tell us a little bit about what the atmosphere is like. We've heard from uh, Dante Wright's parents, but the activists who have been really agitating on the streets, those who may have been in the community, the journalist advocates that we heard that responded to Amir Locke getting shot. I'm sure this has to have riled those folks up. Tell our audience about that, please. Absolutely. Well, there was a large crowd that was gathered here just moments ago, uh, but they all now have gotten in their cars and they're traveling over to the judge's home to hold a protest outside of her home for this sentence that they say is both unfair and a slap in the face to the Dante Wright family. And you're absolutely right. The trauma here in Minneapolis is compounded, not just this sentencing, but also that's on the backdrop of the federal trial that's happening now for the other three officers who are charged with the murder of George Floyd. And then we know that Amir Locke was fatally shot and his parents said their final goodbyes at his funeral on Thursday. And so all of these things are compiling again, right? And what a lot of people don't know about the city of Minneapolis leading up to the murder of George Floyd was that there was a compounding of trauma that happened at that time with the uh, death of J Jamar um, Clark, as well as Philando Castile, and, and so many others. And so what we heard from activists today outside of the Hennepin County Government Center was that they feel that the people in power, the mayor, the interim police chief, legislatures, lawmakers are not listening. There were uh, nearly a dozen bills that were presented to lawmakers here in Minnesota immediately following the murder of George Floyd. And activists today are saying, why didn't those bills get passed? Activists here today were saying, why did the bills that got passed, why did they get watered down? And, uh, you know, again, even in this situation where there is a conviction, it doesn't match up to the amount of time that Mohammed Noor got here in the city of Minneapolis when he said he mistakenly fatally shot Justine DeMond, who was a white woman. And so, uh, again, what we're hearing is that there are two justice systems, one for white America and one for black America. Georgia, I'm glad you brought up the example of Muhammad Noor because Judge Regina Chu brought that up, and I thought that was particularly curious because 
sure, we can make an observation that perhaps this exchange was uniquely different than Derek Chauvin and George Floyd. But this exchange seemed very similar to Noah and Mr. Ms. Damon, excuse me, who were killed because they both responded out of fear, intensity of the moment, and in a mistaken behavior. But Judge Chu seemed to see a difference between the two. I'm not going to ask you to weigh in legally, but does that seem to hold any water to any of the people you were talking about or any of the lawyers you may have interviewed? Well, you know, even with Muhammad Noor, it was very convenient that there was an unraveling of justice in that case because he did appeal and he won his appeal. And so his sentence was reduced uh, shortly before this trial started. And so a lot of people pointed to that uh, because, and this is so significant from a legal standpoint, because Muhammad Noor's case was the precedent in um, in both of these cases, right? Especially we heard it cited a lot in the Derek Chauvin trial. And so for Muhammad Noor to win his appeal, it unravels the foundation that uh, specifically the Chauvin trial was set on. And so while these cases are very different, the details and circumstances are different, there for the community at least is an interconnectedness to the way in which the judicial system and the criminal um, justice system and the police department and how all of these components are working together to produce outcomes that are unfavorable to the black community. And so when you when you juxtapose Muhammad Noor's sentence to Kim Potter's, um, it's not fair. It, it doesn't compare, although the circumstances are, yes, uh, very similar. So one of the things I'm also curious about is that our national organizations sometimes are not consistent or in the same lockstep with what the local branches in those places are. Now, the NAACP has released the following statement, and I believe this is from the national office. So hang tight one second. I'm going to read their statement. The NAACP says, stands with Wright's family in collective outrage as we witness yet another injustice in Minnesota. 16 months in prison and eight months on probation is a slap on the wrist. And scores of black men sit in prison for the rest of their lives for committing nonviolent crimes. Kim Potter will be a free woman in one year, despite the fact that Dante Wright's daughter will live the rest of her life without her father. This only magnifies what we already know. The system is broken. Our hearts and minds are with the Wright family today as they suffer another injustice, end quote. Now, before I go to that, I want, I'll come back to you, Georgia, about that, because there's a lot of intensity on the ground. Is the local branch of the NAACP in the state lockstep with what we heard nationally? Because the national is really, you could tell there's frustration there. They're building up a, a, a frustration and disappointment with the justice system as it is playing out. All right, we're going to pause it right there. We'll pick this up on the other side of the break. That is Professor Ray Baker, my frat brother, sitting in for Roland Martin on Roland Martin Unfiltered from Friday, February 18th. I was on the panel. When we come back from the break, you'll hear my response. And that was Georgia Fort Independent Journalist who was on the ground outside the Hennepin County um, courtroom uh, reporting on what happened. OK, you listen to the African History Network show on Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. Abundant Capital Group is a real estate investment company with over 20 years of experience in real estate. They specialize in two areas of real estate. One, they solve real estate problems with creative financing solutions that give the seller the most money for their property. And two, they show individuals how to get a higher rate of return on their investment capital with real estate note investing. If you are looking to sell or need to sell your property, here is what they provide. Market value offer, even if you have little or no equity, they typically pay all closing costs, which can be thousands of dollars. They close on a date of the seller's choosing and the seller does not have to be out of the house at the time of closing. They take the property in an as is condition and the seller is not required to make any repairs. 
Give them a call or email them today for a free consultation and see how they can help you with your real estate needs. Call them at 973-475-8488. That's 973-475-8488. Visit their website, AbundantCapitalGroup.com. That's AbundantCapitalGroup.com. And email them at ACG at AbundantCapitalGroup.com. Follow them on Instagram and Facebook at Abundant Capital Group. Soul in Motion, celebrating 38 years in the arts. This energetic ensemble of dancers and drummers was started by percussionist Michael Friend and is led by choreographer, associate director Pam Lassiter. Based in the Washington, D.C. area, Soul in Motion is now accepting bookings for Black History Month, Juneteenth, and summer festivals in 2022. Soul in Motion is also available for more intimate events like naming ceremonies and weddings. To find out more or book your date, call 240-452-1349 or send an email to info at soulinmotion.org. Be sure to check us out on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Soul in Motion, celebrating our history, our culture, our future. Soul in Motion, theater, African dance, and drumming since 1984. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation, the future radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotep. It is Sunday, February 20th, 2022. And we are live calling numbers 313-778-7600. 313-778-7600 is to call in number if you have a question or comment. We'll go to the phone lines here in just a minute. I want to go back to this clip from Roland Martin Unfiltered from Friday, February 18th. Uh, Roland is in Liberia right now covering the bicentennial uh, of um, um, Liberia celebrating their uh, uh, the founding of uh, Liberia, 1822. They're celebrating their bicentennial. Um, my frat brother, uh, Professor Ray Baker of Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity Incorporated was sitting in for uh, Roland and I was on the panel. We're going to go back to this clip and you're going to hear from Georgia Fort independent journalist who was on the ground there outside the uh, Hennepin County uh, Courthouse reporting on the sentencing that just took place by Judge Regina Chu of ex uh, Brooklyn Center uh, Minnesota police officer Kim Potter in the killing of Dante Wright. Let's go back to the clip, uh, Jalen. Then we'll go to the phone lines. Yeah, absolutely. The NAACP here locally has been extremely active uh, throughout each one of these cases. And, you know, it, when you talk about from a national standpoint in comparison to being local here on the ground, is the narrative matching up? One thing I really, really want to point out is is the simmering and, and the brewing of all of these things happening and the collective trauma that the community is experiencing. It's very parallel to what we were experiencing before the murder of George Floyd. And so the question becomes, if if corporations and businesses don't want to see that level of destruction, then when are they going to intervene and start using their political power and their corporate uh, power to get some of these bills passed, get some of the legislation uh, that the community was pre uh, presenting forward? When are they going to use their voice and offer resources even for the trauma that the community is experiencing. And so uh, from a local level, yes, absolutely, the NAACP has been in lockstep with the community and the Wright family. And um, one thing I haven't heard much on a national level that I'm hearing locally is the, the idea of anti-Blackness in the Asian community with Regina Chu being an Asian woman and uh, this sentencing being so favorable to former officer Kim Potter, it has raised some questions within the activist community because there's been so much solidarity. Uh, and and the, the, uh, the protesters that we see come out is a, a very diverse group here in Minneapolis. But there has been this reoccurring question about anti-Blackness 
in the Asian community. And I think that this has reignited that conversation. I want to ask a little bit about that, Georgia. Are folks that you're talking to and engaging with, are they moving forward with the hostility toward Asian Americans, believing that there's anti-blackness? Or are they skeptical of anybody who is now buying into the justice system as it exists? Because whomever is now an officer of the justice system is now reflecting the same anti-blackness that our justice system is doing. Well, I want to say that there is anger. I don't think people here are upset with the Asian community. But I think that there have been um, there's been some pushback in the Asian community that um, anti-blackness doesn't exist. It's not a thing within their community because they're also people of color. Uh, but I think in this instance, you're seeing a clear allegiance. Um, to uh, white supremacy. You're seeing a clear allegiance to um, the sympathy and the empathy that Judge Regina Chu showed to Kim Potter today. And so I think it's reigniting the conversation that anti-blackness is a real thing. And just because you're a person of color doesn't mean that you too can't have those values of anti-blackness. Now, I'm going, to ask, I'm going to bring a panel in after this question, but I've got one more question for you, Georgia, right before I go to the panel. In when we saw the unrest after George Floyd and the rebellion after George Floyd, the weather actually was an important factor because the, the weather was comfortable enough that masses of people could get outside comfortably to get engaged in the protest. So ultimately, we saw what happened with the third district police station. We can see you right now. It's not too comfortable, to be honest. And so do you think that the, that the bitter cold of the weather will discourage the groundswell of human beings who would otherwise be involved in activist behavior? Well, I think that we've seen uh, the activist community here get pretty creative with the way that they protest. We've seen a number of car caravans that have happened during below zero weather, where you'll see hundreds of cars taking to the street, honking their horns um, as a form of protest, still having signs uh, displayed, you know, around their car or holding signs outside of their car. So we've seen people get pretty creative and still trying to show up and be disruptive. We've, we've had a number of city uh, sit-ins at City Hall where um, activists and, and students come into City Hall and they sit in because it's warm. Uh, but in terms of the numbers outside, it's a little hard to say. Today is extremely frigid cold. Uh, however, about two weeks ago, there were thousands of people who came out in the frigid cold to demand justice for a mere lot. And so it's, it, it can be challenging to try and anticipate the pulse of these protests and when people are going to show up and what different factors, um, you know, play a role. There's also been a number of um, communication disruptions that I've heard from activists who say that they will post an event on Facebook, uh, a protest event specifically, and the time gets changed. And so people are confused about what time to show up. So there's, there's been some interesting things that have happened within the activist community here. Uh, but in terms of numbers, I mean, just last week, we saw thousands of people out in the street demanding justice for a mere lock. And so we're going to continue following the community response to the Kim Potter sentencing. Uh, like I said earlier, there was a, a number of people gathered here moments ago that have now left in a car caravan to the judge's house. So I'm actually going to head over there and uh, live stream what that scene is like uh, as soon as we get done. Real quick, before you go, tell folks where they can find and follow that live stream so they can also get up to date if they can't you right now because they're watching the show. But if they want to come back a little bit later and make sure they've taken a look at it, tell folks where they can find that. Absolutely. If you look up georgiafort.com, you can connect to all my social platforms and we'll be live streaming to Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. Georgia, stay warm. Go get somewhere warm. We thank you for being on the ground covering this. Enjoy your weekend. Absolutely. You as well. Thank right. you so pa much. Pause it right We're there, We're going to our pa panel pause now. Right there. We're pause joined right by there. Michael M. Hotel, the right host there. of the African History Network show. Pause it right there. Yeah, just back it up about 20, 30 seconds. Follow Georgia Fort at georgiafort.com, F-O-R-T, independent journalist. She's doing some good work. Uh, when we come back from the break, we're going to Theo, line one. Then uh, we're going to go to whoever's on line two. Then uh, I'm going to share the segment from Roland Martin, the filtered where uh, Ray Baker goes to the panel. You get to hear me comment on uh, the sentencing of ex officer Kim Potter. Listen to the African History Network show right here on 9 10 a.m. Superstation, the future radio. I'm your host, brother Michael M. Hotel. 
We'll be back in uh, in a few minutes. The work that I do is larger than the fashion industry. It's larger than the art world. And I believe that I was born to bring newness into this world. I'm Kaima McIntyre. I'm 24 years old and I'm an artist. I create everything from paintings to jewelry design, metaphysical jewelry to be specific, and fashion design. The only reason why my prom dress went viral is because people needed it. Within a few days of going viral, Notori Naughton reached out to me. and She's like, I saw your dress, can you make me a dress? I was equally as shocked to be asked by a celebrity to design their dress at the age of 17. That's just one person and the list just continues to go on to Janet Jackson, to Tyra Banks. It really hits home. That means that the discussion is happening on the grounds in real time. Mental health and well-being have long been a taboo subject in the so-called African-American community. So I enlisted the help of mental health experts, thought leaders, and activists to help kill the ghost of Willie Lynch and heal from post-traumatic slave syndrome. We experience trauma a lot of times um, on a subconscious level. So sometimes something happens to us and we know that it's traumatizing, but we don't really recognize the extent of the trauma. iRedify is a Black-owned digital platform that showcases Black and Brown cultures and people. The books on the platform are written by African-American authors, Afro-Caribbean authors, African authors, and so much more. Kids 14 and under can read eBooks, listen to audiobooks, and complete learning activities. Kids can even write in the books digitally. Get unlimited access to everything on the platform for only $8.99 a month at iRedify.com. Sign up for your membership today. Great. 9, 10 a.m. Superstation, a division of Adele Media. The views and opinions expressed on any program are those of the producers and or the persons appearing on the program and do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of 9, 10 a.m. Superstation or Adele Media. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation. Feature Radio, I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotep. All right, it is Sunday, February 20th, 2022, and we are live I um, want to remind you a couple of things here. Number one, uh, you can still register for the online classes I teach uh, on Saturdays and Sundays, the online history classes. On, on Saturday, it is ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. Kemet's one of the original names for Egypt. Uh, the Ma'afa is a key Swahili term that refers to the great disaster, our Holocaust. This is a 10 week online class I teach. We deal with thousands of years of history and what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. So we had a great class on um, Saturday, February 19th. As soon as you register, you can uh, watch the class we just did this past weekend. We do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. You can uh, go back and watch them anytime. And so even a year from now, if you want to go back and watch the uh full class you can do that i do a powerpoint presentation we have book references articles video clips um uh etc and you can uh, use this information you can use the class with your children also i would say the content is pg-13 the class is on sale uh 80 dollars regularly 130 dollars and the second class i teach on Sundays is from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement in Black Power, 1865 to 1968. So uh, this class, we start in 1803 with the Louisiana Purchase, and we deal with history up through 1968. We deal with the uh, Civil War, Reconstruction, Jim Crow era, uh, Great Migration, Civil Rights Movement, uh, Black Power, uh, World War One, World War II, uh, all that history. Okay. Um, and this class is in the same format also. Now you can register for both classes in a bundle pack, which is the best uh, option. Um, you get the bundle packs on sale for a limited time only on $120. Uh, that's a $260 value. 
And if you've taken any of the online classes with me in the past, um, email me at AHN show at African history network dot com and you'll get uh, 50 percent off. OK. All right. And then coming up this Wednesday, coming up Wednesday, February 23rd, I'll be on a panel discussion for African-American History Month. I'll be on a panel discussion sponsored by Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated. And this is dealing with reparations. Uh, Wednesday, February 23rd, 2022, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Michigan State uh, Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated, Michigan State Organization Social Action Committee. And uh, I'll be on the panel with some other people uh, as well, uh, including um, Yousef uh, Bungie Ch Shakur from Detroit, uh, Yvette Carnell, and uh, some other esteemed panelists as well. So check that out. We'll post a link here at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. It's a virtual panel discussion. You can uh, you'll be able to watch that. All right, let's go to the phone lines, and then we're going to go back to uh, Roland Martin and Filter. You'll get to hear me on the panel. Get me here. You'll get to hear me respond to uh, the sentencing of only two years for uh, Kimberly Pollard. Let's go to um, line one. Let's go to uh, Theo Broughton from Hood Research. Line one, Theo, welcome to the African History Network show. Thanks for holding. Tell, uh, so, uh, go ahead with your question or comment. Well, thank you, and happy Sunday. Happy Sunday. Um, I, I um, disagree with the judge's decision. Mm -hmm. I have um, two questions. Question one, will um, this officer be able to apply for retirement because she was well over 20 Six 20, years. What, 20, Twenty-six years. years. Yeah, I don't know if she'll be able to apply for it, retirement, and I'm not. I'm not sure. I have to look at that. Mm, uh, that that would be interesting. But um, the other question is, is for you. We um, uh, we're talking about the uh, racism and uh, reasons why uh, people are still looked down on African Americans. Do you believe that this negative, disgusting, gangster rap style music uh, that, that seems to promote violence causes people to look at the black community with such um, disrespect? Yeah, it's definitely a contributing factor. This is why I have been speaking out against negative corporate controlled hip hop for years. Uh, mm -hmm. not so much against the artists, but the white corporations that pimp the artists and market poison mm -hmm. to African Americans, because generally speaking, they would, they generally speaking, they would not have white artists doing the same thing, marketed directly to white children. And this is one of the reasons right. why, um, uh, I came out so strongly against the song WAP by Cardi B and Megan Thee Stallion, mm -hmm. uh, on Atlantic records, which is a white corporation that's using two women of mm -hmm. African descent to market prostitution. And uh, when you listen, so if, if people uh, miss the, I did a panel discussion, for those that don't know, I did a panel discussion with three mm -hmm. African-American women dealing with breaking down the song WAP and dealing with this understanding of white supremacy and racism. Two of the women on my panel were uh, conscious hip hop artists. And we did this back mm -hmm. about, uh, we did this back in like August, uh, twenty. August uh, 20, August of 2020. Okay. I think it was, I think it was 2020 when it's all 20, I think it was 2020 when the song came out, August of 2020. Uh, Cause the song came out, I think about August 13th, something like that. So the, the baseline of the song repeats the phrase. There's some whores in this house 79 times approximately. And Ooh. when you watch the video, when you watch the video, uh, all the women in the video are, are of African descent, except Kylie Jenner. And white people created a petition online to uh, demanding that Kylie Jenner, Kylie Jenner, who's a billionaire, be digitally be digitally removed from the music video WAP because there was a consensus among many white people that they didn't think Kylie Jenner should be in the video. Not because the video was that great, but because they wanted to rescue this white woman from this whorehouse. So, so they were saying. Let the Negroes can do that. That's fine. They weren't saying get rid of the video. They weren't saying oh. they, 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 they weren't saying that they said they wanted to rescue the white woman from the video and let the Negroes do that. We don't understand the oh, game that's God. being played on us. Go ahead. Go mm -hmm. ahead, Theo. 
Well, I uh, I definitely agree with you, and it's sad that the uh, National NAACP Image Award has um, the stallion as one of the nominees, and Little Nas X in his uh-huh. satanic kind of video, <laughs> but for the lyrics in these songs to just be targeted to the black community, it's it's largely. amazing. There are people L- who enjoy the uh, halftime of the Super Bowl when the look, the I- image that was there, the, the men were holding on to their private parts and the girls were humping on the floor and all, but they just overlooked that. And the fans well, in, the stands, well, in the stands just went wild. Well, well here's the thing. The, 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 the humanization, if you study this, if you study our history, and we deal with this in the classes I teach. We deal with this in a lot of my lectures. The dehumanization of African Americans has always been entertainment for this country. If we go back to the minstrel shows that start in about 1828, 1829 by a man named T.D. Rice, Thomas Dartmouth Rice, who becomes known as the father of minstrelsy. He becomes known as the father of the minstrel shows. And um, he puts on tattered torn clothing and adopts a Southern dialect and puts on blackface and imitates enslaved Africans. And then this becomes known as the minstrel shows and becomes one of the most popular forms of entertainment in the country. Uh, so when we study our history, uh, now what's interesting is like when the movie, The Birth of a Nation came out February 8th, 1915, directed by D.W. Griffith, uh, the movie calls, calls race riots in the streets, but African-Americans had enough sense back then to protest against the movie. The NAACP led protests against the movie, The Birth of a Nation. Charlotta Bass in California, who uh, was the publisher of the California Eagle Black Newspaper organized uh, a protest. Uh, William Monroe Trotter up in Boston organized protests as well against the movie The Birth of a Nation. The movie The Birth of a Nation rejuvenated the Ku Klux Klan. It showed the Ku Klux Klan as being the heroes of the movie. And the movie is Mm -hmm. is based upon uh, a novel by a man named Reverend Thomas Dixon called The Klansman. OK, we had it. We had enough sense to understand when we were under attack and we protested against those negative images. Today, oftentimes we embrace those negative images and don't understand that it's coming out of a system of white supremacy and racism designed to suppress us also. OK, OK, Theo, right. I got to get, I gotta get these Thank other you. calls. Thank, thanks for calling. All right. Uh, You're welcome. OK, we'll go. Hey, hey, Theo, is your show on after mine? Is your yes, show? It is. 11, what, night, what, what's the name of your show? What's the name of your show? All right. What's the name it's of your show? 11 p.m. until 1 a.m. What's, right after you. What's the name of your show? Oh, oh, Night Talk in Detroit. I'm sorry. Okay. All right. Night Talk in Detroit. All right. Mm-hmm. All right, Theo. Okay. Uh, we're Thank gonna you. go to line two uh, in just a second here. Who 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 who, who, who we have who we have on line two, Jalen? We have Jihad. We lost caller Sabu. Okay, so we'll call back uh, Jihad. We'll go to Jihad in just a second. I just want to pull this up right quick. So a lot of people, uh, and then we'll go to Jihad uh, before the break. So a lot of people may uh, remember uh, hip-hop artist Rick Ross. And you may remember um, a uh, lyrics to a song he, he was on, U-O-E-N-O, okay? And you may remember um, that the song uh, drew protests because of lyrics that promoted date rape. Okay. Now this is from billboard.com, this article. Okay. This is from billboard.com. And let me see if I can get this ad to close out. Um, Rick Reebok drops Rick Ross over U O E N O rape lyrics. Reebok, the shoe company, the athletic wear company, Drops Rick Ross over U O E N O rape lyrics. After this is from April 11, 2013. Just to, just to show you the difference. Now I've been dealing with the I've been dealing with um, the propaganda, the media, and things like this for going back to when I was in college at Wayne State University in the early 1990s. Okay, and my background's in marketing, so I've been studying this for three decades. Uh, Rick Ross had a contract to endorse Reebok. He drew controversy because of lyrics on uh, on a song where he talked about uh, slipping Molly into a woman's drink. Rick Ross has been under fire for his controversial lyrics on Rocco's song U-O-E-N-O. The lyrics say, put Molly all in her champagne. She ain't even know it. 
I took her home and I enjoyed that. She ain't even know it. He raps. He drew protests from women's rights groups. OK, including one called uh, Ultraviolet. All right. So long story short, what happened was you had the women's rights group, ultra, a lot of white women, a few African-American women with them. They were outside of Reebok's flagship store in New York City protesting. OK, and Rick Ross said, I don't condone, I don't condone rape. He apologized for the lyrics, things like this. But guess what Reebok did? Reebok didn't say, uh, Reebok didn't tell the white women, well, he wasn't talk talking about you, he was talking about the other women. Reebok tell the white women, uh, well, if you don't like it, uh, raise your children better. Reebok, di Reebok didn't tell the white women, uh, if you don't like the music, don't buy it or change the radio station. That's not what Reebok said. Reebok said, you know what? Nah, we're going to cut our ties with this Negro. After stirring up controversy with lyrics deemed pro-rape, Reebok has decided to end their partnership with Rick Ross. Reebok said, quote, Reebok holds our owners to a high standard and we expect them to live up to the values of our brand. Unfortunately, Rick Ross has failed to do so. While, now, just back up for a minute. Let's just back up. Game recognizes game. Rick Ross got songs with the N word and B word all through it. He had it when Reebok signed the contract with him. That was all right as long as he was calling white women, uh, black women the B word and calling black people the N word. It was all right with Reebok. The Negro stepped out of line and white women started protesting. All of a sudden, Reebok has a conscience. While we do not believe that Rick Ross condones sexual assault, we are very disappointed he has yet to display an understanding of the seriousness of this issue or an appropriate level of remorse. But Reebok, it was all right when Rick Ross was calling black women a B word. You signed his contract after you knew the type of music he put out. Get out of here with that nonsense. Game recognizes game. You listen to the African History Network show. I'm Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. Follow the story Skeeter Hawk as attorney Ben Brooks rediscovers his Gullah Geechee heritage and finds romance along the Gullah Trail and the Sea Islands. Jilted by his fiancée who refused to marry him, Ben Brooks goes back home to Gullah country. There, the Gullah people come to call him Skeeter Hawk. While rediscovering his heritage, Skeeter Hawk unravels dark family secrets. A beautiful childhood friend, Fulla, becomes his guide as they travel the Gullah Trail from North Carolina to the Sea Islands in South Carolina in search of more answers. Ben Brooks falls in love with her and becomes torn between her and his former fiance who wants to rekindle their romance. He also deals with a premonition that one of his enemies is pursuing him, providing a backdrop for mystery romance, intrigue, and suspense in this page-turning novel called Skeeter Hawk from author Sabby Stone. Order your copy today at SabbyStone.com. That's S-A-B-Y, SabbyStone.com. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. The Superstation, the Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotep. It is Sunday, February 20th, 2022, and we are live. All right. Um, okay, we're going to go back to the phone lines in just a second here. Uh, so right before the break, I was talking about Rick Ross, and I was talking about um, also um, – the song WAP by Cardi B and Megan Thee Stallion, financed by Atlantic Records. I, I did a panel discussion back on uh, this is August sometime, August 2020. WAP, Women Are Priceless episode. There are no whores in this. Uh, uh, whore, there are no whores in the house. And I had three uh, brilliant sisters on the. Uh, I had three brilliant sisters on the panel discussion. That's at our Facebook fan page, The African History Network, The African History Network. Uh, the video we broadcasted it there. Uh, click on videos and you got to go back 
uh, we put I just posted the link here on the thread of the broadcast. It's also on our YouTube channel. I'll probably uh, post this on the homepage of our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, because if you go through, I, I go through and break down all this stuff. People want to compare, you know, the music of the compare WAP to and say, oh, we had the two live crew, you know, back in the back in the early 1990s. That was before YouTube existed. Do you, do you realize that the the, the video WAP was viewed 23 million times? in one day on Cardi B's YouTube channel alone. It was viewed something like 60 million times over that weekend when it first came out. There's no way you can compare the early 1990s to today. We didn't have smartphones, we didn't have the internet, we didn't have high-speed internet. I mean, we were still using the gopher system in the early 1990s. If you know what, I was teaching computers back in the early 1990s. If you if you know what, I mean, we, we didn't have Google. Google wasn't created in 95. YouTube wasn't created to 2005. The, the level of the weaponry, the level of the technology today is so much far advanced. You can't even compare it. People were still going to the record store buying, buying songs. We weren't dealing with digital downloads in the early 1990s. This is a whole different world. All right. Um, so read the, read, read this article here from, uh, billboard.com dealing with rick ross okay because i talked about this when it happened and uh, we can look at michael jackson and the song they don't really care about us and the jewish community got upset over michael jackson over a, a couple of lyrics in the song sony took the took all the cds off the shelf removed those lyrics put the cds back on the shelf now all the music using the n-word all that stuff that stuff stayed on the shelf that was fine this over here? Oh no, no, you gotta you gotta change that. You can leave the stuff up calling black women B's and H's, all that. That's fine. No problem there. Okay. Read this article here from Billboard.com. Rebot drops Rick Ross over U O E N O rape lyrics. You only protect what you respect. You only protect what you respect. So we have to have another sense to understand when we're under attack and fight back. What you do for yourself, what you do to yourself, and what you allow the people to do to you and get away with. Is based upon what you think about yourself. What you think about yourself is based upon what you have been taught about yourself. What you've been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, heard, and seen about yourself. All right. Um, we're going to go back to this clip, then phone lines, because we run out of time here, Jalen. Let's go back to this clip. This is from Roland Martin and Filtered Ray Baker, who's sitting there for Roland, goes to the panel. I'm on the panel. Let's go to. Uh, let's go back to the clip. Enjoy your weekend. Absolutely. You as well. Thank you. We're going to pivot and bring in our panel now. We're joined by Michael M. Hotep, the host of the African History Network show, Kelly Basea, JD, communication strategist, and Xavier Pope, host of Suit Up News and the owner of Pope Law Firm. Everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Xavier, I'll start with you because this is a legal question. You heard Georgia and I call back to Muhammad Nwar's example when Justine Damon, mm -hmm. Damon was shot and how similar it looked to us but neither one of us are legal experts, so I defer to you. Am I out of bounds for trying to compare these two incidents? No, you're not out of bounds for comparing the incidents uh, in terms of a mistake being made um, by the officer. Uh, and even if it's a reasonable mistake, uh, it, it was reckless, and that was the standard. And that's just what the judge openly said, Judge Chu. He called Kim Potter's behavior reckless. And uh, this goes beyond uh, the scope of her duty. And uh, for the prosecution in this case to call for upward uh, gradation in the sentencing and the judge looking at that, and instead of just flat out denying the upward trajectory sentencing, she chose to downgrade the sentencing. Um, some of the reasoning of the judge was questioned. Um, particularly the deterrent aspect of it. You just had a, a rundown with Georgia of uh, Amir Locke and of uh, uh, George Floyd. Uh, and the fact that this continues to happen in this community and breaking the souls and the mental capacity of uh, the a social contract uh, that is broken in that community. And so uh, a deterrent uh, of this magnitude when you only give uh, a, a Kim Potter her tears um, and a slap on the wrist in terms of the sentencing, uh, it, it, 
it, it, remains, it remains to see where where is the real connection when the legal precedent is there, and you go to that and, and apply for tears in this case, and you have that drip all over the justice system, and it's now drowning out true justice um, for the death of Dante Wright. I appreciate the wordplay there, the tears dripping over the justice system. Kelly, as a communications expert, I'm curious about what the historian Errol Lewis calls the semi-public transcript, which means that thing that's being communicated that we haven't quite heard explicitly, but all of us are clear to hear. And so when we see and we hear Dante Wright's mother say, I thought that my white tears might matter because they're legitimate, but then we hear that Ms. Chu observes the behavior of Ms. Potter in the courtroom, and that means something in a way that seems to supersede what else was there. What do you think both law enforcement officials and citizens in Minneapolis and Hennepin County, what do you think they heard when they hear this verdict? I think they heard that black lives don't necessarily matter. And the threshold for a black life to matter is so high that not even the justice system has that standard, really. And I kind of alluded to this uh, back when the verdict came down for the George Floyd case, in that they basically set the bar incredibly high. Like, the, the reason that he was sentenced, found guilty, all of that, uh, I'm talking about Chauvin, it was beyond the standard of beyond a reasonable doubt. There should have been no question that that man should have uh, been convicted and sentenced. But we had to basically put on uh, a trick pony show and and dissect a man's life and dissect the last eight minutes of that man's life down to the millisecond so that other people could see that not only did this black man's life matter, but that someone who thought it didn't matter took it. With, with this case, with the Ken Potter case, it shouldn't have to take that much effort to see that not only was, I, I'm not going to argue malice, but she was reckless in her conduct towards this young man. The fact that the judge alluded to there was a chaotic situation, mm -hmm. she was responding mm -hmm. to it. Kim Potter created that chaotic situation. Kim Potter created that situation. Kim Potter is the one who doesn't know the difference between a taser and a gun. That situation is what is chaotic, not the fact that a black man is scared of police in a jurisdiction where police don't really like black men or black people for that matter, as evidenced by their conduct towards the black people in that jurisdiction. So what did people hear? I know I heard that my life does not matter in Milwaukee, and I'm sure that other people heard that too. Yeah, Minnesota as well. I mean, Milwaukee has its own host of uh, oh, Minnesota. racial, I racial problems and challenges. But Hennepin County, a place that's often thought itself to be good. Uh, Michael, uh, Kelly told us about reckless, and she, she really hammered reckless, and I appreciate her doing that. Mm -hmm. Oxford defines reckless as uh, without thinking or caring about the consequences of action. Right. So if a law enforcement officer demonstrates that they behave without thinking or caring of the consequences of their action, why then do we think that they are no longer a threat to anyone else if we only hold them for 18 months? Well, this was uh, another example of white privilege, and this is what I was afraid of. Even though she was convicted, I, was, I still wanted to see what the sentencing was going to be like. And, you know, she should have been, so the prosecution wanted seven years. Uh, Judge Regina Chu uh, gave her two years. She should have gotten at least seven years because What's really important is to look at the minutes after um, Kim Potter shot uh, Dante Wright. She didn't render aid. She didn't go after the car because the car drove down the street and hit another car. She focused on herself. She called the, uh, her union uh, a representative. She said that she uh, grabbed the wrong gun. She said she's going to jail. She focused on herself. She didn't focus on Dante trying to save his life. That's more reckless. OK, so she should have gotten at least seven years. Uh, but but the other thing that I think is really important to understand is a couple of things. Number one, I, I watched it live and, you know, just Regina, Regina Chu, then after she renders her sentencing, then she wants to bring up President Barack Obama talking about put yourself in the other person's shoes. Well, why don't you put yourself in the shoes of Dante Wright's parents who are there in court grieving? 
trying to get a just sentence for their son who was uh, wrongly killed and won't see his own son uh, grow up. The other thing that's really important to understand is understanding how elections have consequences. Judge Regina Chu was appointed by Governor Jesse Ventura in 2002. She's a Hennepin County uh, District Judge. She was reelected in 2004. She, uh, she was elected in 2004 to serve a full term, reelected in 2010 and 2016. If she runs for reelection, she's up for reelection in 2022, this year. The activists have to organize to vote her ass out of office also. Elections have consequences as well. All right, we're going to continue this on the other side of the break. Uh, and then we'll go to uh, back to the phone lines. We'll go to Sabu. Uh, you listen to the African History Network show on Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. It backed it up about 30 seconds or so, Jalen. We'll be back in a few minutes. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation, the future radio. Okay, uh, right before the break, we were talking about the sentencing of ex-Brooklyn Center, Minnesota police officer Kim Potter in the killing of Dante Wright. And I was sharing these excerpts from Roland Martin Unfiltered from Friday, February 18th, 2022. I was a panelist on the show. I'm a panelist each Friday on Roland Martin Unfiltered. I wanna go back to this clip where I'm uh, giving commentary on the sentencing. Let's go back to this clip, Jayla. Tura, in 2002, she's a Hennepin Hennep County uh, District Judge. She was reelected in 2004. She, uh, she was elected in 2004 to serve a full term, reelected in 2010 and 2016. If she runs for reelection, she's up for reelection in 2022, this year. The activists have to organize to vote her ass out of office also. Elections have consequences as well. And, and, and yes, they should protest at our home also. Uh, uh, this, is, this is serious. And lastly, uh, we talked about the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. Where are the corporations that put out statements when George Floyd was killed and pledged money and things like this? They should be putting pressure to get the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act passed. It already passed the House of Representatives 220 to 212, March 3rd, 2021. No mm -hmm. Republicans. I want everybody to understand me. No Republican in the House of Representatives voted for the bill. But one Republican who did put out a tweet that he made a mistake and was going to change his vote. Okay? So where are the so so now these Corporations have laryngitis and amnesia as well. So we have to put pressure on them also. Okay. Oh, can you target United <laughs> Health Group? Absolutely. 3M target has a target on US Bank, yep. Mayo yep. and so many more. Okay, pause it right there. All right, that was Ray Baker sitting there for uh, Roland Martin, and I was on the panel also. Okay, uh, very quickly here, and then we'll go uh, back to the phone lines. Uh, this uh, some of those same corporations were some of the corporations who signed on, some of the same corporations who came out and put out statements supporting Black Lives Matter when George Floyd was killed and there were protests out in the streets and, and the corporations pledged money. Some of those were some of the same corporations who in July 2021 signed on to a letter supporting the passing of the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. But those corporations have laryngitis, laryngitis and amnesia now. Read this article from NBC News. More than 150 companies back update to Voting Rights Act. More than 150 companies back update to Voting Rights Act. Major businesses like Pepsi, Macy's, Ikea, and Nestle signed on to a letter supporting the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. Okay, now most of them have gone silent. Pepsi, Amazon, Target through their support behind updating the Voting Rights Act in a letter released Wednesday. This was July 14th, 2021 when this article came out. More than 150 companies, including these corporations. But, uh, you know, they've largely gone silent. After you had a metaphorical lynching of John Lewis and Dr. King in the U.S. Senate, no Republicans voted for the John Lewis Voting Rights Act or the Freedom to Vote Act in the Senate. We know Manchin and Sinema voted for the bills. The Freedom to Vote Act is Manchin's bill. Now, Manchin and Sinema didn't vote to change the filibuster, but none of the Republicans voted to change the filibuster also. So, as I've said before, I know people mean well, and we know that um, the Black Eagle... Uh, uh, the talk show host, uh, uh, he was on a hunger strike, um, and, uh, he had to stop his hunger strike. He was on it for something like 74 days. Um, and we know other like college students have gone on, 
uh, hunger strikes also um, pro, uh, trying to draw attention to the Voting Rights Act. But what we should do is um, launch economic boycotts against some of these uh, corporations, okay, especially these corporations who finance um, uh, Republicans who are pushing these uh, voter restriction bills, okay? And we need to put their uh, cash registers on a hunger strike, okay? Joe Madison, Joe Madison. Uh, we need to put the, the talks for wholesale, thinking of Joe Madison. We need to put some of these corporations' cash registers on a hunger strike. We don't go on a hunger strike and, and endanger ourselves. We need to redistribute the pain to some of these corporations, especially the ones who are financing Republicans in state legislatures and in the Senate who keep voting against our own interests, which goes back to the article that I wrote December 15, 2015. Why did Dr. King tell us to redistribute the pain, understanding the power of economic withdrawal? OK, you can read all of my articles at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Click on read articles by Michael M. Hotep. So we don't need to go on a hunger strike and put our own health at risk. We need to put the corporation's cash registers on a hunger strike and redistribute the pain. Let's go back to the phone line. Let's, let's go to Sabu, line two. Sabu, welcome to the African History Network show. Thanks for calling back. Thanks for holding. Tell us where you're calling from. All right, we have, go ahead. Whoever, whoever we have next. Thank you, man. You don't get nothing else from out of me, man. I want you to accept these flowers, man, because I want you to hear me. Yeah, I can hear you. What's your name? My name is Sabu. Sabu, okay. Well, you call you calling from Detroit? No, sir. I'm calling from Wichita, Kansas. Oh, Wichita, Kansas. Okay. All right, go ahead, Sabu. Oh, I said Kansas, and I said that for you. <laughs> okay, Kansas. Okay. <laughs> go ahead. Uh, but first of all, man, I, I want to extend some flowers first. Oh, thanks. Because I really appreciate you being a kind dude for our community to get truth and information. Oh, thanks. And, and I really love it that you got you collaborating with uh, Wally mm -hmm. and uh, getting this here out there to us. You know, for me, brother, it, it, it's all been pretty frustrating dealing with this. And, you know, I, you know, Will Shakespeare said that. A rose would still be a rose where it called any other name. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, you could put Jacari in there, uh, or a, a number of people with regards to what white privilege is. And one thing you know for sure is that this judge has assimilated to this system. Mm -hmm. And I could go on and on, but I just, I just, I'm just really frustrated with this. And I'm not going to give up on God because I'm a God believing person. Right. But and it just, it just, just so frustrating, man. And if we don't do this for ourselves, man, ain't nobody going to stand up for us. Right. I understand that. All right, Sabu, keep listening, okay? Well, thanks for calling. Okay, yes, thanks for sir. calling. All right, he's in Kansas. Thanks for calling. And keep in mind, people, Judge Regina Chu is elected by the people and she can be voted out of office by the people. And she's up for re-election this year. She chooses to run for re-election. She's up for re-election in 2022. Elections have consequences. OK. Um, OK, I want to go to this next story and then let me know if we have any more callers, Jalen. Uh, OK, so earlier in the week on Thursday, we talked about this story from uh, out of Indiana. And this deals with uh, the school district in Indiana that uh, the Brown Browns County uh, school district in Indiana that uh, sent home a uh, they sent home a permission slip dealing with a Black History Month lesson, and they gave the option uh, they gave the option for parents to opt their children out of this Black History Month lesson, okay? Now, this is a school district that is 97% um, white. This happened in the elementary school, Spronica, uh Elementary School. 
in uh, Browns count in Browns County. Uh, let's go to a clip. Uh, let's go to uh, the clip from NBC News, Jalen. That's clip number two that gives some background information on this. Veronica Elementary School in Brown County allegedly sent a letter home to parents allowing students to opt out of Black History lessons. The last line of that letter in this picture reads, if you would like to opt your child out for receiving these lessons, then sign the form below and have your child return it to the school to give to the teacher. The post is making its rounds on social media with thousands of retweets and comments. One response, this makes me really sad for America. Another writes, why would this even be an option? 13 News reached out to the counselor who wrote the letter and were referred to the superintendent. After leaving messages, we showed up. We went to the Brown County Schools Administrative Office to speak with the superintendent, but we were told she's not available. Then Wednesday afternoon, 13 News found out the superintendent sent a letter to parents and staff about the situation. She released this statement to 13 News. She says, in part, quote, we do not allow students and parents to opt out of required curriculum, including instruction on social studies and histories. Any decision related to parental consent and curriculum determinations are made in accordance with the law. We are looking into the matter to determine the justification for the language included in the letter. We will respond to any parental concerns on an individualized basis. Okay, so that was from uh, NBC News. And if we look at uh, the article here from the Washington Post, uh, an, an Indiana school, let me scroll up here, an Indiana school banned Black History Month lessons. A letter sent to parents allowed them to opt out. All right. Uh, we're going to go to that clip uh, from WHTR Channel 13 in just a second. Uh, Jalen, the clip is in the article. Uh, and here is the tweet uh, that shows the a uh, memo that was sent home to parents. A public school in Indiana is giving parents the option to opt their children out. I don't know how many parents uh, opted out. It has at the bottom of it, my student does not have permission to receive this lesson. The school district is, uh, well, the, the school, Spronica Elementary School is 97% white. Uh, let's go to WHTR uh, channel 13. Let's uh, start that clip. All right, we're coming up on the break. We'll come back to that. On the other side of the break, that's clip number four. We talked about this from Roland Martin Unfiltered on Friday, and I was on the panel. And um, you're going to hear what I had to say about it also. Listen to the African History Network show right here on the Antenna M Superstation, the Future Radio. I'm Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few, in a few minutes. Stand by. How's everybody doing? Share this broadcasting on social media platforms. All right, here's the information uh, to register for the online history classes I teach on Saturdays and Sundays. And we have a bundle, we have a bundle pack where you can register for both classes. Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade and from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. Back from break in two minutes. What does self-care mean to you? To us, it's an opportunity to reconnect with nature. A chance to create something remarkable. At Sage and Elm Apothecary, our handcrafted skin care and household products immerse you in Earth's sweetest nectar, connecting you to nature in a way you never imagined. See for yourself and visit us at sageandelmapothecary.com.
Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. The Superstation Future Radio. Okay, uh, right before the break, um, we were talking about this story out of... Uh, okay, I, I sent you a separate clip, clip number four, Jalen, but cue it up at the 5330s from Roland Martin Unfiltered. Uh, cue it up at the 5330. Okay, right before the break, we were talking about this story out of Indiana. Now, I talked about this here on the show Thursday, and we ended up talking about it on Roland Martin Unfiltered on Friday. An Indiana school planned Black History Month lessons. A letter sent to parents allowed them to opt out. All right. Uh, let me know when you had a clip queued up. And then uh, also take a look at uh, this other story here, which we'll probably talk about on Monday's show. This is from the New York Times from February 12th. Uh, teachers tackle Black History Month under new restrictions. Teachers tackle Black History Month under new restrictions. Okay, let's go to uh, let's go to the uh, clip from Roland Martin and Filter because we run out of time here. Also, in Indiana, elementary school parents received a letter giving them the option to opt out of Black History Month lessons. Brunica Elementary School Counselor Benjamin White sent this letter home giving parents the choice to pull their kids out of class for the Black History lesson. The letter went viral on social media. Here's how the superintendent of the school district responded on Twitter. He says, quote, earlier this week, unauthorized by Brown County Schools, was released to elementary school families erroneously advising our students and parents that they could opt out of certain instruction regarding Black History Month, close quote. To be clear, our dis the district does not permit students opt out of history lessons, including ones based on a historical injustice. We apologize for the confusion caused by the letter and offer our assurances that Brown County Schools is committed to providing an inclusive educational environment for all students in families. Let's start with you, uh, Michael. I'm going to bring back our panel. Michael, Xavier, and Kelly are here to join us with this conversation. Michael, I'm going to start with you. Do you believe the superintendent when they say that they are intending to be inclusive of all history, including ones that center around injustice? Well, you know, it's interesting that we talk about this topic today because I talked about this last night on the African History Network show. So Spronica Elementary School is a school of approximately 240 students. The school is 97 percent white. So the counselor and I read the uh, I read the um, the memo that the uh, the letter that the counselor sent out, Benjamin White. And at the bottom, there's a place where parents can sign off to opt out of the uh, Black History Month lesson. Um, the superintendent, Emily Tracy, from looking at the reporting from WTHR uh, Channel 13 there in Indiana, um, it looks like what she's saying is true. However, I want to see how this matter is fully handled. OK, I want to see how this matter is fully handled. I don't know. I haven't been able to uh, find out how many parents opted out or if any parents opted out either. I've been looking at reporting from the Washington Post, NBC News, and local reporting from WTHR Channel 13. But this is a uh, uh, this is a crazy story. And there was a counselor who did this, and I haven't been able to find any statements from the counselor why he did this. He referred he, he referred uh, the news media to uh, Superintendent Emily Tracy. And Kelly, okay. when you hear what's right, going pause, on, pause right I here, mean, this seems to let's the, go to uh, can... let's go to the clip quickly from uh, WTHR Channel 13 out of. Uh, uh, Indiana, if you had that queued up, it's in the article. So people check out this article, Brown County schools, viral letter gives families choice to opt out of black history month lessons. Uh, you had a clip queued up a photo. Of, huh? Article I don't have. Oh, you don't have it. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, it should be, uh, wasn't that clip number three? Right, I didn't receive clip number three. Okay, I thought I sent that in a separate email. All right, let's go to uh, let's go to Jihad. Um, okay, let's go to Jihad on uh, line three or whatever line Jihad's on. Jihad, welcome to the African History Network show. Thanks for holding. We got a couple minutes left. Go ahead with your question or comment. We lost Jihad. Okay, that's fine. 
Um, this is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna shoot this to you. See if we can get this uh, queued up. I didn't. I didn't know that you didn't have clip number three. So uh, this is only a, a couple of minutes here. Let me see. Just uh, queue this up. Okay, I just sent that to you. That's from WTHR Channel 13 out of Browns County. So I, I want to find out more uh, what happens in this uh, in this case here. Uh, th th this is an article from uh, February 16th, 2022, updated February 17th. Spronica Elementary School in Brown County, uh, Indiana, allegedly sent a letter home to parents allowing students to opt out of Black history lessons. A photo of the letter was shared on social media where the response has gone viral, okay? And they have a statement here from... Um, from the um, school superintendent, uh, Emily Tracy. They have a statement here from her. Uh, Emily Tracy sent a letter, uh, Brown County School Superintendent Emily Tracy sent a letter to parents and staff Wednesday and released the following statement from Channel 13 News. I did just, just press play when you get it queued up. Our district uh, supports teaching, go, up. go ahead. Southern Indiana Elementary School is under fire tonight because of a letter that it sent home to parents this month. This letter in question gives students the option not to learn about black history if their parents so choose. This letter quickly went viral on social media. So tonight at 6, Argina Glaros shares the response from the school district. Spernica Elementary School in Brown County allegedly sent a letter home to parents allowing students to opt out of black history lessons. The last line of that letter in this picture reads, if you would like to opt your child out for receiving these lessons, then sign the form below and have your child return it to the school to give to the teacher. The post is making its rounds on social media with thousands of retweets and comments. One response, this makes me really sad for America. Another writes, why would this even be an option? 13 News reached out to the counselor who wrote the letter and will refer to the superintendent. After leaving messages, we showed up. We went to the Brown County Schools Administrative Office to speak with the superintendent, but we were told she's not available. Then Wednesday afternoon, 13 News found out the superintendent sent a letter to parents and staff about the situation. She released this statement to 13 News. She says, in part, quote, we do not allow students and parents to opt out of required curriculum, including instruction on social studies and histories. Any decision related to parental consent and curriculum determinations are made in accordance with the law. We are looking into the matter to determine the justification for the language included in the letter. We will respond to any parental concerns on an individualized basis. Thanks so much. Okay, so that was from WTHR Channel 13 in Indiana. Uh, be sure to visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. You can register for the online history classes I teach on uh, Saturdays and Sundays, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, where they didn't teach you in school. Okay, those watching on Facebook and YouTube, keep watching for a few more minutes. Uh, we'll be here for a couple more minutes. Right now, it's correct your own behavior. It's not over till we win. We're kind of forever. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Peace. Okay, stand by. All right. Uh, if you like this type of information, also, you can support the African History Network, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App, also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. We're here six days a week. This helps us keep doing the research, stay on the air, keep broadcasting, pay some of the bills. This is our official cash app account, dollar sign, the AHN show, S-H-O-W. And uh, when you go to it, it says Michael shows my picture there. These other ones, th this is our link here also for cash app. These other ones are fake African History Network cash app accounts. I did not set them up. We have the link, the button here for donate through PayPal also. Uh, and then you can register for the online classes I teach on Saturdays and Sundays. Um, and then on Sunday, it is from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. Okay, so visit our website, African uh, for that. All right, now, uh, let's see here. Uh, what happened? Okay. 
So the article from um, the Washington Post de dealing with this story also, the article from the Washington Post um, entitled Indiana, let me pull this back up from the Washington Post. Uh, in Indiana school planned Black History Month lessons, a letter sent to parents allowed them to opt out. Now, we'll, we'll talk about this uh, topic more on Monday's show because there's a good article from New York Times that I want to deal with, dealing with uh, Black History Month lessons and the pressure that's on teachers now uh, teaching Black History Month with these uh, anti-critical race theory laws. But on page two of this article here from the Washington Post, it talks about... Um, Indiana is among at least 27 states. Let me scroll down in this page too. Indiana is among at least 27 states considering such legislation, like anti-critical race theory legislation. Um, if you back up, news of the opt-out form comes as teachers around the teachers and school administrators around the country grapple with how to teach race-based lessons. In 13 states, new laws or directives have limited how race and sometimes gender are addressed in classrooms, leaving fearful, uh, leaving teachers fearful of the repercussions and in some cases opting to pull lessons, the Washington Post reported. Now, Indiana is among at least 27 states considering such legislation. Now, uh, there was a bill passed by the Indiana State House of Representatives that's controlled by Republicans. In January 2021, India, uh, called House Bill 1134. Now, it hasn't passed the state Senate in Indiana. It hasn't been signed into law, it just passed the House. House Bill 1134 proposes limits to race and history lessons uh, in the state of Indiana's classrooms, the Indianapolis Star reported, although Senate Republicans, uh, although Senate Republicans there on Tuesday proposed changes that would slightly weaken the bill. In January, 2022, in January, 2022, a similar bill stalled in the Indiana Senate, state Senate, after its author, Republican State Senator Scott Baldwin, said teachers' lessons about fascism and Nazism should be impartial. He later apologized and told the Indianapolis Star that Nazism, Marxism, and fascism are a stain on our world history. What caused you to have that change of heart? State Senator Scott Baldwin, what caused you to have that change of heart? The flood of laws and proposals aimed at reining in lessons on race and gender has, pro has been prompted by conservative opposition to critical race theory, an intellectual movement that examines the way policies and laws perpetuate systemic racism. But critical race theory is not taught in K through 12 schools. So why all the bills to ban critical race theory and it's not even being taught in schools? What are you afraid of? So check out this article from the Washington Post. An Indiana school planned Black History Month lessons. A letter sent to parents allowed them to opt out. Now, once again, I don't know how many parents decided to opt their children out. I haven't been able to find that information. I don't know. Okay. All right. So we'll talk about this some more on tomorrow's show. Uh, very quickly here, run out of time. So quick update here. Um. So Brian Flores, we talked about last Sunday was our Super Bowl show. And we, we've been rebroadcasting that show. NFL's racism. Uh, the NFL's racism overshadows the Super Bowl. That was our Super Bowl show. So go back and watch that. We did over, I think it was over two hours, something like that. But Brian Flores, who was uh, fired by the uh, Miami Dolphins after having two winning seasons. Because the last thing you want is a Negro that wins too much. 
Um, he's been picked up by the Pittsburgh Steelers as a senior defensive assistant and linebackers coach. Uh, there's a good article here from NBC News about this, but also one from um, ABC News as well. I want to go to this clip from ABC News here, and then uh, we have to get out of here. So Pittsburgh Steelers hire Brian Flores after coach files racial discrimination suit against the NFL. Now, the, the lawsuit is still going to continue. OK. And uh, ABC News has a, a, a good segment on this. Let's go to this clip here. Just a second. All right. Let me cue this up. Okay, we'll cue that up from ABC News. Uh, let me pull up this article. Brian Flores vows to continue lawsuit. Let's go to this. Brian Flores vows to continue lawsuit. Um this uh continues to, to to continue lawsuit against nfl despite hiring by uh the steelers let me flip over to this here all right just a second here let me cue this up Okay, uh, former Dolphins head coach Brian Flores is suing for racial discrimination. This is from February 19th, uh, 2022. Uh, Brian Flores, the uh, former Miami Dolphins head coach who is suing the NFL over discrimination claims, has found a new job with a new team, the Pittsburgh Steelers. And Mike Tomlin, uh, African-American head coach, is the head coach of the Pittsburgh Steelers. Only other African-American head coach in the NFL is... Um, is with the Houston Texans. Okay. Uh, Lovey Smith. All right. The Pittsburgh Steelers announced Saturday that Flores will serve as their senior defensive assistant linebackers coach next season. Uh, quote, Brian, uh, Brian's resume speaks for itself. And I look forward to him adding his expertise to help our team. Steelers head coach, Mike Tomlin said in a statement, now, Flores attorney uh, Douglas H. Wigder of Wigder LLP and Johnson's Electorakis of EEP Law said in a statement on Saturday that Brian Flores' lawsuit against the league will continue. Quote, we congratulate Coach Flores on his new position with the, with the Steelers and thank Coach Tomlin and the organization for giving him this opportunity. While Coach Flores is now focused on his new position, he will continue his race discrimination class action uh, lawsuit so that real change can be made in the NFL. Now, Flores, uh, Brian Flores' lawsuit contends that the NFL has discriminated against African American coaches for head coach roles and cited an experience where he said he was offered an interview for a head coach spot with the New York Giants. The 40-year-old Brian Flores was fired by the Dolphins last month in January after back-to-back -back winning seasons and was interviewing with other teams. Flores said he, texted, uh, he, he sent a text message to his mentor, New England Patriots head coach Bill Belichick, Bill Belichick about the upcoming meeting Belichick allegedly sent text messages congratulating Flores on getting hired by the Giants before the interview took place, according to screenshots of the text messages that were included in the lawsuit. Bill Belichick later allegedly te texted back to Brian Flores that he made a mistake and the Buffalo Bills offensive coordinator Brian DeBall was actually getting the job three days before Brian Flores interview, according to screenshots. Now the league has denied any wrongdoing and said in a statement that Brian Flores claims were without merit. We know that also um, Loretta Lynch, uh, the NFL said this week is hired former U S attorney general Loretta Lynch, the first black 
female attorney general to defend itself in the suit. She's part of the legal team. She's not handling it all by herself, but she's part of the legal team. All right. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens there because I mean, it could be a, it could be a situation where she reviews all the evidence and says, look, he has a good case. You need to settle with him. OK, uh, and and Flores is focused on bringing real change to the NFL as opposed to just a monetary damages. All right. Uh, I want to go to this clip here from. Uh, ABC News on uh, this update. Your development in the NFL. Brian Flores, the former Miami Dolphins head coach who is suing the league and several teams alleging racial discrimination, has been hired by the Pittsburgh Steelers, joining their coaching staff. But that lawsuit continues. Here's ABC's Janae Norman. The recently fired coach suing the NFL for racial discrimination, landing a new job tonight, working with the league's only current black head coach. Mike Tomlin announcing the Pittsburgh Steelers have hired Brian Flores as their senior defensive assistant and linebackers coach. Flores recently telling Nightline how much he loves coaching. It's the best job in the world um, to have an opportunity to help young men grow, reach their potential, become the best version of themselves. Flores, a former head coach of the Miami Dolphins, was fired in January after back-to-back -back winning seasons and said he was passed over for the head coaching job for the New York Giants. In that lawsuit, Flores claiming the Dolphins owner told him during the 2019 season he would pay him $100,000 for every loss and that the Giants only interviewed him to satisfy the Rooney rule, which mandates teams interview at least two external minority candidates for head coaching positions. The owners of both teams have denied the allegations. When you speak out, and this is, this is the case for all you know minority and black coaches, if you speak out, um, you may be given up that opportunity to do exactly what you love. Flores not on the sidelines for long. Steelers head coach Mike Tomlin saying Brian's resume speaks for itself. And I look forward to him adding his expertise to help our team. And while we haven't yet heard directly from Flores about his new role with tonight, his lawyer saying in a statement, Flores will continue his race discrimination class action quote so that real change can be made in the NFL. Wit. Janae, thank you. All right. Great reporting by Janae Norman for ABC News. All right. So the lawsuit continues. Congratulations to uh, Brian Flores on this new position. The fight continues. It's not over till we win. And the real, the number one goal is ownership in the NFL. Because when you own the team, you can hire whoever you want to to be the coach. All right, look, we have to get out of here. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, support the African History Network. Register for the online classes that I teach also. If you want me to do a presentation for your group or organization, email me at ahnshow at africanhistorynetwork.com, ahnshow at africanhistorynetwork.com. Also, you can register for um, our email newsletter. Text the word Kemet, K-E-M-E-T, to 22828. Text the word Kemet, K-E-M-E-T, to 22828. The sign up for our email newsletter. Remember, right now is correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. We're kind of forever. And we'll talk to you tomorrow. Peace. All right. Talk to you tomorrow. Peace. The work that I do is larger than the fashion industry. It's larger than the art world. And I believe that I was born to bring newness into this world. I'm Kaima McIntyre. I'm 24 years old and I'm an artist. I create everything from paintings to jewelry design, metaphysical jewelry to be specific, and fashion design. The only reason why my prom dress went viral is because people needed it. Within a few days of going viral, Notori Naughton reached out to me and she's like, I saw your dress, can you make me a dress? I was equally as shocked to be asked by a celebrity to design their dress at the age of 17. That's just one person and the list just continues to go on to Janet Jackson, to Tyra Banks. It really hits home. That means that the discussion is happening on the grounds in real time. STEM Forward, helping our community find their place in the emerging fields of science, 